Good afternoon, everyone. Let's give it up for Cinema Detroit and on a wonderful event on with partnership with science on screen. And it's a Absolutely. We really enjoyed The Wicker Man, and there was a lot of symbolic meaning that was displayed in The Wicker Man. But before we dive in on uh, connecting The Wicker Man to honeybee conservation and what we, he what we do here at Detroit Highs, we would like to do a brief introduction about who we are and the work that we do to support people and pollinators in City Detroit. So my name is Timothy Paul Jackson. And my name is Nicole Lindsay. And we're the co-founders as well as co-executive directors for Detroit Hives. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization whereby we work to improve underserved communities to benefit both people and pollinators in the city of Detroit and Southeast Michigan. We exist in over 20 locations and we manage over 53 honeybee colonies right here in the city of Detroit. I'm a native Detroiter, born and raised in the Motor City. And the same for me, native Detroiter, born and raised in, in the city as well. And neither one of us had a background studying bees or being outside or interacting with beekeeping. My background is in commercial photography. In short, I'm a creative. I like designing stuff, whether it's graphic design, taking one of the pictures, or doing anything that involves creating things that don't exist from my mind to bring it out into reality. Yep, and so I attended Open University with a degree in psychology, but most of my background has been working in customer service. And I attended Wayne State University, and I also attended Mumford High School, and we saw that in the, the previous second film. So you're probably wondering, how do we explore this magical world of conservation, saving the bees, and giving back to our community? Well, it was a very long story, and I'll be very brief. But it all starts with depression. I was dealing with a lot of depression in business and a lot of stuff was going on with my family from losing a lot of my family members to medical malpractice. From my mother to my father to also my grandmother were all claimed due to medical malpractice. So it left me in a really dark, deep state. And I wanted to find ways to reverse depression. I wanted to find ways to be more grateful, more optimistic and more happier. And I came across a book called Think and Grow Rich it allowed me to be more happier and allowed me to be more grateful. But also I came across what's called grounding and what's called sun gazing. And this is simply when you take off your, your shoes and you allow the sun charged soil recharge your feet, but also staring at the sun at safe zones. When Nicole and I did this, it allowed us to be more happier, uh, optimistic and more grateful that when we came across an article around the summer of 2016, the city of Detroit put out a call to action. They were looking for residents, block club associations, nonprofit organizations to buy back many of its vacant lots. See, at the time, the city didn't have a budget to attend to any of these vacant lots and they were causing issues in our community. Issues around blight, issues around crime, and issues around violence. With our optimistic approach from sun gazing, grounding, and just for being more in the outdoors, we saw this as an opportunity to give back to our community but also an opportunity to change the narrative of what people thought about our city. So we wanted to find a way, how do we change the narrative and how do we invite investors or more people to visit the inner city community opposed to going downtown Detroit or visiting Midtown? But we knew in order to do this, we had to do something that was completely outside of the box, game-changing and innovative. We weren't into creating ideas that exist we wanted in to create something that was done before. We wanted to create something new and different in our eyes. So originally, we thought about a peacock farm. We can transform a vacant lot to a peacock farm. <laughs> they're great, they're, low, they're uh, inexpensive, and it'd be great for a community to create local field trips. Then we thought about an outdoor photography studio. With my background in photography and advertising, I thought this would be a great way to invite local photographers, are also people in the community to create a space where every season will be a prop. And it'll be open all year round, including the winter. Then we thought about our urban campsite, a place where nature deprived humans can visit to vent and to also seek mental space and also mental healing, especially for nature deprived people like myself that want to ground or sun gaze that look, maybe live in an urban environment and can't get to a rural or a space where they can you know, express themselves. All of these were great ideas that we had on our vision board, but unfortunately, I'll go back to my day-to-day -day operations, and so with Ms. Lindsay. Up until later that year, around December of 2016, I suffered from this really bad cough and cold that I could not get rid of. 
I tried what I thought was home remedies, over-the-counter medication, and my very last result was to go to the doctor. However, Nicole was concerned with my health. She said, you need to go see a doctor, something's wrong with you. I went to go see a doctor. And the reason why that was my very last result is because, again, the very long medical malpractice history in my family. So I went anyway, and the doctor didn't have any answers for me, and he placed me on antibiotics. And I was still dealing with this really bad cough and cold that I pretty much just forgot about it. I had this cough that I would just always cough for almost every three to five seconds. And when I have an advertising studio, it was in Ferndale, it was on a nine mile uh, in Woodward, right at the McCole building. So every time I go to the place in Ferndale, I will always visit a convenience store called the Nine Mile and Hilton Market. It's a convenience store. So I went to this particular store and the store owner recognized my really bad cough. He said, young man, you should try this local raw honey. It can help with your cough and cold. I said, get out of here. That ain't going to work because I tried X, Y, and Z. And local honey ain't going to do it. That honey is not going to do it. He said, our honey is local, is raw, and I buy it directly from a beekeeper. And I simply asked him, what's so special about local raw honey? And he gave me this very long rundown on how honeybees create immunotherapy through their product, but also how they visit things like dandelions, which is a perennial herb, and it's highly medicinal. When you consume it over time, it has so many health conditions. When he told me that, he sold me on a product. I tried it within three weeks, three tablespoons in the morning, afternoon, and evening, it got rid of my cough. From there, I began to learn more about this product, and it really caught my attention because I wanted to find ways to battle sugar. You know, I was concerned with being pre-diabetic and dealing with diabetes, that I wanted to find a natural sweetener. And I found out that honey serves as being a natural sweetener, and it serves as also being a Swiss Army knife tool that can unfold many useful benefits. For one, you can place honey on top layer of your skin. It serves as being topical, meaning that it's antifungal and antibacteria. And if you're dealing with a cut or a burn, it will treat that area. You can place it in your hair, you can place it on your skin, you can consume it as a sweetener and also a cough remedy. I began to dive in and engulf myself and learn so much about honey and honeybees. Nicole began to see my interest and she came up with this real weird, crazy, ridiculous suggestion. She said, how about we transform a vacant lot into a bee farm? And boom, that's where the idea, and that's where we began to co-pollinate Detroit hops. So moving forward with the film Wicker, we want to go over a few things that we saw you hold that later. Yeah. Um, starting with, uh, there were Nicholas Cage, his name was uh, Edward Mollis, I believe. And there were skip hives that you saw inside on that movie. And that's one of the oldest forms of beehives. Yep. Yeah. One of the oldest forms of beehives. Also, Edward Mollis started as Nicholas Cage. I mean, Nicholas Cage started as Edward Mollis. He was allergic or appeared to be allergic to bees. Now, according to to Roger Sutherland, which was the president of the SIMBA, Southeastern Michigan Beekeepers Association, only 1% of people in the world are allergic to bees. Now there are over 20,000 native bee species that exist in the world. There are over 5,000 native bee species that exist in the United States. And Michigan is home to over 467 native bee species like bumblebees, leafcutter bees, mason bees, orchard bees, longhorn bees, cuckoo bees, the list goes on. The honeybee, however, does not originate from Michigan, nor does it originate from the United States. The honeybee originates from Africa. And as people began to travel to Africa, they of course discovered honey, and that led them to discovering honeybees and wanted to take them back to their respective places. So they transported honeybees over to Asia, and then from Asia over to Europe. And we received the European honeybee in the year 1622 in Jamestown, Virginia. And by the year 1776, those same honeybees found a way to swarm and land right here in Michigan. Also on the Wicker Man, uh, they mentioned drones. I don't know if you heard the end. The drone must die. The drone must die. So inside a colony, you have what's called a queen bee. There can only be one queen bee per hive. You have worker bees. Worker bees do all the work inside the hive and outside the hive. And guess what? Worker bees are all females. Mm -hmm. Lastly, what you have is called the drone bee. The drone bee are the male bees, and we have very one very important role is to provide genetic diversity in the hive. I'm gonna share a little bit more about the drone bee and what happens in the wintertime. Yeah, so make... yeah, so in the wintertime with the drones, or here in Michigan, 
Um, when temperatures are 45 degrees and, be and below, the cluster, the colony begins to cluster up and the queen sits in the middle. So they're focused on keeping that colony warm. So they can maintain the temperature between 90 and 95 degrees, but they'll shift as a cluster to eat the honey and the honey is their store of food. But before they go into the winter time, us as beekeepers, so around August and September, we'll start seeing those worker bees start kicking those drones out. They're making a sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> so what they'll do is they'll pick them up and they'll fly them away. If they'll try to come back, they will bite their wings off, pick them up and fly them away so they can't come back. So that's why they get rid of the drones in the winter time because they will eat up all their stored food. So they have to ration off their honey so they can make it throughout the winter time up until the spring. So us as beekeepers, we make sure that we have 80 to 100 pounds um, for our bees so they can survive. Also with the male bees, their very important role, once again, is to provide, provide genetic diversity. So they can mate with the queen, maybe four to 40 drones can mate with the queen at one time. And the reason why she mates with so many male drones is again, to provide genetic diversity. There are so many different types of characteristics personalities and ethnic backgrounds with honeybees. You have, of course, Africanized, Russian, Italian, Sagatras, Colonial, Caucasian, and European. So when you mate with so many different types of drone with different genetics, it helps to provide and keep strong hives. Once the queen, or once the drone reach climax and mate with the queen, that particular drone bee immediately dies. Their tentacles explode and it breaks out to the queen, and that's the end of them. Yeah, and they so go out with a bang. They end with a bang. <laughs> Without further ado, we also like to touch on the Wicker Man and discuss some of the torture that was done in the film before we move on to our other presentation. And we want to talk about ethnological warfare. So through many years and many centuries, there have been ways to create beehive catapults where military would use live beehives and they would swing them over their opponent so they could sting and destruct their colony. Also, they've been able to use scorpion bombs, bug pit prisons. For thousands of years, military strategists have used insects as weapons of war, not only to inflict deliberating pain on enemies, but also to deliver deadly pathogens and destroy agriculture with the intent of causing widespread misery, sickness, and hunger. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to tell you that here at Detroit Highs, we're not focused on that. We are focused on the education and conservation of pollinators. What is a pollinator, you ask? A pollinator is anything that can help transport seed from one flower to the next. This could be wind, this could be butterflies, these could be uh, ants. ants, ladybugs, bats, bats etc. So speaking about bees, again, Michigan is home to 467 native bees. Again, the honeybee does not originate from this region. So we do have an illustration of the difference between bees and wasps. Oftentimes, people do get them confused. As you saw in the movie with Nicolas Cage, he kept swatting at a bee, and that was a bee. But in most cases, a bee will only visit you for two reasons. Either you look like a flower, or you smell like a flower. Once they see that you're not a flower and you don't have anything sweet to offer, they will politely fly away. Opposed to yellow jackets, when we visit orchards, or picnics around the late summer, early fall, you may be visited by a yellow jacket, and this is because they're hungry. They don't build up honey stores opposed to honeybees. And honeybees and very much, very similar insects have a very strong nose receptor. Honeybees can smell the sweet nectar of flowers hundreds of miles away. So imagine what a yellow jacket could smell on your lips when you had barbecue or any type of pop. They're hungry and they're trying to find food. So one way that we mitigate yellow jackets from robbing our hives or from trying to visit our guests from our bee farm is that we feed them. We feed them late summer and early fall and we notice that when we feed them, they don't bother our guests nor our hives because they're fed and that's what they want. And then also, yellow jackets and wasps, they die out towards the end of the season. So some obvious differences between a honeybee is of course they're fuzzy. They have a lot of hair on them and that hair serves as antennas, but also that's one way they can help collect pollen. Also, honeybees have a barred stinger that's not illustrated. You will only see that when it's time for them to defend their colony. And with their barred stinger, worker bees that, that have the barred stinger, they can only sting you one time. 
because their stinger is barbed and when it gets caught into our skin, the only way they can retrieve that stinger or pull apart from that is to get the rubber part of the lower abdomen, which unfortunately causes them to die. It does release a pheromone to also trigger other worker bees or guard bees to be more defensive. And that then uh, the venom is still left in you. So it's also medicinal. To be stung by a honeybee is medicinal because honeybees visit flowers for nectar and pollen. And also bee stings were the very first sign or very first function of acupuncture. Another difference between the yellow jackets or wasps is that they have very little to no hair on them. They have a straight and pointy stinger and their diet mainly consists of other insects. And they die out during the winter. So only thing that lasts between uh, a worker, bee, I'm sorry, within the yellow jackets would be the queen. She begins to hibernate and bury on the winter. Yeah. Um, yeah, also, um, I don't know if you talked about, yeah, so the honey, I'm sorry, wasps balance out the insect where they eat other insects. So they don't build up any type of stores. They are constantly going out looking for food to eat. So let's talk about Detroit, and it's the place to be. Again, Michigan is home to 467 native bee species, and with Detroit having so many vacant lots, it has indirectly been boosting native bee populations because of these vacant lots haven't been sprayed with any type of insecticides, pesticides, and herbicides. And the number one decline in pollinators is what? Number one decline. Insecticide. You're close. Mm -hmm. Pesticide. You're close. Herbicide. You're close. Suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Fertilizer. Nope. The number one decline in pollinators is habitat loss. Habitat loss. We've done away with their natural habitat. We've created roads, freeways, highways, homes, and this place are native insects, wildlife, and etc. So a way to rebuild or a way to support our pollinators is by creating habitats. And the, Detroit has been a way, Detroit has found a way to boost native bee populations through vacant lots. And on these vacant lots, you have uh, clovers, dandelions, and many different types of wildflowers that haven't been sprayed, that you're starting to see more wildlife like deers, uh, fowls, uh, hawks come to visit the city of Detroit. So again, we operate a nonprofit called Detroit Hives, and part of our mission is to improve underserved communities for both people and pollinators. Again, we exist in over 20 locations throughout the city of Detroit and Southeast Michigan. Some of our premier locations include, of course, Wayne State University, the CNIT Data Center, Michigan State University, Detroit Partnership of Food Innovation and Learning, the Ford Resource Engagement Center, Gleaners Community Food Bank, Peachtree Parks, State Fair Hoover Pollinate Parkway, uh, Jefferson Chalmers, uh, Madison Community Garden, and the list goes on. Our story went viral. The film that you saw earlier entitled Detroit Hives. It was a company called Spruce Tone Films, and they heard about the work we were doing in the city. They reached out and they contacted us and said, we want to be able to share your story with the world. Well, they did just that. That particular short film has been screened all over the world in over 200 countries, including it was highlighted on National Geographic. With that in mind, it allowed us to generate quite some buzz that allowed us to leverage some partners and some sponsors. And some of our partners and sponsors include, of course, the City of Detroit in partnership with the Detroit Land Bank, Airbnb, our favorite slows, Barbecue, yeah. Peace Street Parks, mm -hmm. Whole Kids Foundation, and the list goes on. But there are others that we have not added, again, from Wayne State University, Michigan State Detroit Partnership, and many more. Once again, some of our core values include education, conservation, sustainability, and community engagement. We call this our 3P system. People, planet, and pollinators. Some of our programs and projects include our very first project, the East Warren Apiary. This is located at East Warren and McCullum, where we transform a vacant lot, a 10-year-old vacant lot, to serve as an outdoor learning space to create a social, environmental and financial impact right here in the city. That once vacant lot has home over 800 honeybee tours. What used to be vacant now serves as an outdoor learning, learning space. Here's another photo of us tending to some of our hives within the East Warren apiary. This next photo 
it's really exciting. So that's Nicole, <laughs> definitely holding the fist. This particular photo is is uh, the Brightmore Pollard Habitat. And you guys will begin to take a tour of our Brightmore Habitat today. So this particular lot was once vacant. It was donated to us from a real estate company. And we were able to transform that space to a home to support people and pollinators within the Brightmore community. It is home to over 300 perennials from ranging from echinaceas to rough blazing star to uh, common milkweed, swamp milkweed, common bergamot, yarrow, the list goes on. Not only is it certified as a monarch way station, but it's also certified in pollinating partnership as a bee friendly farm site. And we also work with the local fire station to create uh, rainwater, I'm sorry, to fill our rainwater bucket so that we have a local water source. And there's also some photos of our volunteer days. As you can see, there's also photos of working with the fire station where not only have they watered our plants, but they also keep our rainwater stations filled as well. So these are great ways to create jobs in the community, but also a great way to work with local fire stations and community organizations through bees and through pollinators. I don't like what you saw in Wicker movie. We're using bees for good. <laughs> Here's another photo of one of our farm sites, the Brightmore Farm Habitat, where you see it's looking really good and blooming really well. And this site is dominated by native bees, by the way. People often ask, um, does honeybees, um, are they, do they compete with native bees? The problem is not with native bees and honeybees. Again, the problem is, is with habitat loss. So if there's not enough food, of course, everyone will compete. But we were to plant more diversified types of foods or flowers, for our pollinators, it can create environment supportive for both. We are on a mission to inspire the next generation of leaders on sustainability. And our way of doing that is through our Be The Change program. Here's a couple of photos of some of the activities, uh, urban tours, visiting schools, working with Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and readathons that you see illustrated. Nicole, mind sharing about the Be The Change program? Yeah, so our Be The Change program, we expose and educate over 2,000 local students to conservation um, to provide hands-on learning experience for youth to appreciate all living things and embrace the beauty of nature. Host in-person and virtual hire tours and educational workshops. Also in partnership with the Skillman Foundation, we work with six students from at Mumford High School to reimagine vacant landscapes in their community in addition to creating a design plan to support people and pollinators. The thing is when most developers come into neighborhoods, they're focused on people, a design that's functional for people. No, no, Oh, okay. So, um, so they're mostly focused on people, like as Tim said, but they leave out our our, I'm sorry. That's good. <laughs> they leave out our insects and our animals. They don't and think the about, and the youth as well. They, don't, they never sit down and get their opinions. So us as beekeepers in the community, we vision ourselves as their spokespeople. And we also engage the youth when it comes to development because it is going to be their place too. So we need to get their input. And a lot of times they can vision things that are outside of the box of our thinking. And they have some really cool ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Starting with this idea, which is one of their ideas that they helped bring to the East Warren Apiary. So in two, 2019, I'm sorry, in 2019, we found a way to partner with the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy and also Detroit City Council to introduce and pass a resolution recognizing Detroit as an official B city. Now we already know Detroit is already dubbed the Motor City. Come on now. We want to find a way, how do we tie those two together? Well, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the Motor City Garden. What is the Motor City Garden? You ask? Well, we transformed a 1981 Oldsmobile Colors to serve as a living pollinating habitat for native bees. Inside this habitat, we work with Team GM Cares to remove all the internal parts of this car. We also work with a local contractor beekeeper to create a flooring to support soil, the weight of the soil, and also wildflowers in the car. And also, Even the grill was replaced to serve as a native bee home. And the trunk of the car is also home of peppermint, strawberries, and many different types of flowering plants. We also work with Clint. Unfortunately, uh, 
he has passed away recently. Um, but he was very instrumental in working with the Heidelberg Project and painting these wonderful, wonderful bees on our car. Not just any type of bee, but sweat bees, honey bees, and bumblebees. Mm -hmm. We want to show a diversity of pollinators. And also along with his fiance, Erin, who's also an artist, and she works with the Heidelberg Project. And as you see in the photo, we installed many different types of perennials from the front to the trunk, and then also in the front of the car, the grill, you see above here, it's a native bee home to create shelter for our native bees. So unlike honeybees, honeybees can travel up to six miles. That's three miles from their hive and three miles back to their hive. But a good sweet spot for them is a mile and a half. With native bees, they don't fly so far. They can only fly between four to 500 feet. So it's really important for them to have local food. Just like us as humans, we don't want to drive 10 miles or 300 miles to get an apple or a slice of bread. We we'll won't be able to find some that's a sweet distance for us. Yeah, especially with the gas prices now. <laughs> yeah. We also, in partnership with the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, and Pollinator Partnership, develop a cool and unique sign to engage the next generation of leaders in sustainability. It's through a way to support wildflowers or weeds, what most people think are weeds. It's entitled, Weeds Are the Bees' Needs, or Weeds Is the Bees' Needs. We also work with Boy Scout Troop 3600 to develop Detroit's first Airbnb for bees. <laughs> and through our work has inspired others locally, nationally, and internationally. And we had others reach out to us from Kansas City, Missouri. And through our model, we developed Mohawks KC in Kansas City, Missouri. And also we founded National Urban Beekeeping Day. Here are photos of our supporters, Miriam Pearson, and her team over at Kansas City, Missouri, as Mo Hives, Kansas City Hives, and they're also wearing fabulous shirts that celebrate National Urban Beekeeping Day, which is celebrated annually July 19th. And this was founded in 2019. You just never stop. We are on, we just <laughs> love what we do. So in 2018, we wanted to find a way to, once again, to engage the next generation of leaders on sustainability through mobile messaging. We developed an emoji app called Bemoji to raise awareness of bee conservation through mobile messaging. And we developed Bemoji, which has already generated 100,000 downloads on the iMessage app. So let's highlight some of our accomplishments. In short, we created Detroit's first educational apiary that connects people with pollinators. And we hosted well over a thousand tours in the city of Detroit from the East Warren Apiary and many locations beyond. We educated over 2,000 local students on bee conservation and we updated this since then. We now exist in over 23 locations. We partnered with Spruce Tone Films to create a documentary which has been screened in over 200 countries. It's also been paired with an educational curriculum as well. And then also, I just want to highlight some of the things. You don't want to toot our horn. We found a National Urban Beekeeping Day, which is celebrated annually on July 19th. Um, we're the board members of Keep Michigan Beautiful Incorporated, part of the partnership with Urban Pollinator Task Force Committee members. We partner with local restaurants and businesses to sell our honey and bee related products to support sustainability. And lastly, we help establish Kansas City Hives as Mo Hives KC in Kansas City, Missouri. But we're not done yet. So we do have some goals for this year. And part of our goal is to transform an existing vacant commercial parking lot into the State Fair Hoover Pollinator Parkway. This will serve as a centralized hub to benefit, again, both people and pollinators. It will address climate inequity. It will, it will address stormwater runoff and also support the conservation of pollinators within the Osborne community. It will also provide educational opportunities for all ages from 8 to 80. Introducing again the State Fair Hoover Pollinator Parkway. This particular project it's just over a quarter of a million dollars, and we're happy to say we raised 100% of the funding thanks to some reporters like Amazon, the Community Foundation of Southeastern Michigan, uh, the DEGC Neighborhood Grant, and etc. At this moment, we'd love to open the floor for any questions and answers or for QA. Or do you guys want to say that for when we get to the B fire? Or we can say yeah. it when we get to the AB area. Uh, yeah. Probably have more of them there then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, lastly, we definitely invite you. I'll get to your question. One second. 
Lastly, we definitely invite you to join the hive. Follow us on social media at Detroit Hives. All of our hashtags is at Detroit Hives, D E T R O I T H I V E S. Also, visit our website, info at DetroitHives.org, for any of our volunteer events, opportunities, and or ways you can support and give back to the bees. You have one question in the back. Yes. Uh, I just wondered. Um the, like the broad local honey, is that like safe if you have like, plant allergies? Is it still safe to eat like honey from the local area? Is this the allergen? You know? What type of plant allergy do you have? Do you know? Juniper. You said juniper? Juniper. Uh, that's another one. Hmm. That's a good question. That I do not know. That is the very first question I've had in relates to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I do not have an answer to that. That's but I can get back with you. <laughs> when I come across it. That's a very good question though. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, the bees do retrieve the nectar and the pollen from the flower, so I'm, I'm not sure. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. No problem, thank you all. Thank you all. We're so happy to visit our Brighton Fire Habitat and learn why Detroit is a place to be.